Hopefully you're convinced at this point that Dijkstra was right that there's no trivial solution to this problem. That it seems like a simple problem, but it's actually very tricky to solve. There are some easy ways to solve it that we're going to look at before we get to the solution that Dijkstra had. And they all involve cheating. But in practice, we can cheat. Cheating means that model that Dijkstra had of how our concurrent processes run, we're going to build a machine that has a different model and can do different things. So the first way to cheat is to say, well, we're not going to allow arbitrary interleavings. We're going to have some way to tell our processor that when we enter the critical section, we don't want anything else to happen. If we had a way to turn off interrupts, which are the only way that there's going to be a context switch to run some different thread, we know that our critical section, once we enter it, no one else is going to enter another critical section. So this is, in some ways, an easy solution. Is this actually used? Have you seen any code that does this kind of thing? The place you saw it was when Iron Kernel sets up the interrupts to handle the key press. What's actually going on here, these instructions are disabling interrupts. The kernel code is not designed to be multi-threaded. It's all assuming a single thread, at least of the, the kernel execution code. So in this case, it's disabling interrupts not to provide really this mutual exclusion property. Although it's certainly a necessary thing. If you're going to change the interrupt table, you certainly don't want an interrupt to come in while you're in the middle of doing that. But it's also necessary to, to be able to change what's in the interrupt table. But this is what's going on. So these instructions here, the CPSR is a special register that keeps track of the program status. And one of the properties of the program status is whether interrupts are enabled or not. This code is changing the values of those bits to be zeros. And then when we're done, it's restoring them to be whatever they were. In our kernel code, we can do this. Should user level code be able to change those bits in this register? To be able to turn interrupts off? OK, good. So the answer is no. Why not? Yeah, if you can turn interrupts off as a user level program, you're preventing the kernel from getting control of the machine back. But the only way the kernel gets control of the machine back is when an interrupt happens. If a user level program can modify the bits in those registers to turn off interrupts, well, then it owns the machine. The protections on memory that the kernel has are still there. If it could change other bits in this register, it could change some of those as well. But once you've turned off interrupts, the scheduler is not going get to get to run again. So at least in terms of the CPU resource, if a user level program could do this, it would own the whole machine. So we certainly can't let user level programs do that. But this is in the kernel, so it's OK. So that's the easy solution to this problem that traditionally a lot of kernels take, is to say, I don't want to have to think through all these exclusion problems and worry about what might happen if another thread tries to do something while I'm doing this. Before I do any of these tricky things in the kernel, I'm going to disable interrupts and know that this code is going to run single thread. Does this work today? Does this work for a modern kernel? Is it enough to disable interrupts to know that they won't actually happen? Yeah. Yeah, so the key is the multi-core. Right? So this register is for each core. So you might be able to turn off interrupts for your core, but if you've got multiple cores, and all modern machines do, essentially, unless you can disable interrupts for all the other cores, there could be some other interrupt that gets into the OS code at the same time. So this no longer gives you the kinds of protections that used to, unless you really assume that you only are ever running on one core. So this works multiple threads on one core. Turning off interrupts means that nothing on that core will ever interrupt your thread that's executing, but another core might, and might be sharing state with this core. So this solution does not work well once you have multi-core. And it depended on this assumption that there's one processor that controls all these threads. And when interrupts are turned off, that turns it off for all of those execution threads. But that is a traditional solution. The other solution we're going to talk about is you could change the memory. So the assumption Dijkstra had about the memory was it had atomic instructions that could read and write into the store, but no other atomic operation on the store. That you could do a read and get a value back. You could do a write, and those were ordered, and nothing happened in the middle of a read or a write. But there was no way to do both a read and a write in an atomic way. Between any read and write, any number of other things could happen. So if we change the store to have an atomic operation that does both, so we'll call it test and set. And what test and set does is it does both a read and a write. And it does them atomically. Nothing can happen between those two events. 
So what we're going to do with test and set is we're going to set the value of some register, the value of the location that we're setting to true. So we're going to set the value in some memory location to true. And we're also going to return the current value. So we're going to do a read on the current value and replace the value with some new value. In this case, we're always going to replace it with true. So if we had an atomic test and set instruction, can we solve this mutual exclusion problem? So now we're going to use test and set. So we've got a lock. And we'll use the lock to mean the same thing it did before. If the lock is true, it means some thread has the lock. And the other thread asking for it can't enter the critical section. If the lock is false, it means you can enter it. If you want to enter the critical section, what should you do? So suppose you called test and set. So let's say thread 2 calls test and set. And thread 1 already has the lock. What is thread 2 going to see when it calls test and set? So what test and set does, right? there's no failure. Right? It doesn't set any flags. It doesn't do anything other than it returns the current value and it sets the value to true. So there's no, it doesn't do any, anything other than that. So what's the return value going to be if thread 1 has the lock? True. If thread 1 has the lock, that should mean the lock is true, and the test and set's going to return true, however you spell true. This is why we use ones and zeros, because true is too hard to spell. So if it returns true, what should thread 2 do? If that means that thread 1 or some other thread already has the lock, so if you call test and set on the lock and you get back true, what do you do? Yeah, you wait. You cannot enter the critical section. Right? Someone else has the lock, so you wait. If you get back false, well, that means the lock was not set. But because of this atomic test and set instruction, now it is, and you have it. So all you need to do if you have test and set, your loop is going to be like this. So you're going to do test and set on the lock if the result is false, that means the value that was there before you called it was false, and you can enter the critical section. So that means if this is not true, now you can enter the critical. And otherwise, you can't. So you just keep waiting until it's true. We're not quite done. What else do we need to do to make this correct? Good. Yeah, so we also need to release the lock. If we don't release the lock, whoever grabs it first never gives it back. So we also need to set the lock to false. But that's all we need. If we can do that, if we have this test and set, set instruction, none of these interleavings that are bad can happen. Because we've combined the if test and the set into one thing. So that actually makes it possible to do this very simply. Here's our code with, with test and set. Do actual processors have instructions like this? Is this a magic thing that seems really hard to actually implement? So certainly, unless you design your hardware to provide this, you can't build it. You couldn't take some processor that only provides read and write and build a test and set. But you could design hardware and design memory systems that provide it. If you look at most modern processors, or even processors going back at least 20 years, many had a test and set instruction. And x86 does. It has this BTS instruction, which does a bit test and set. And it does exactly what we've described. It has an atomic operation that does two things. It sets this flag, so CF is a flag with the value of this bit currently, and it sets the value of the bit to 1. So it's doing exactly what I described in this test. Set. So that's x86. What ARM has is a little different. So ARM does not have the test and set instruction like Intel does, but it does have instructions that are designed to provide mutual exclusion. It does it in what will seem like a fairly obtuse way. And the reason for that is what it's really trying to provide with these is not just an easy way to implement a lock. It's also providing a way to do lock-free data structures. We won't get into that today. Maybe in a later class we will. But what you really want to implement things efficiently in the kernel is to be able to do lots of manipulation of the data structures without needing to lock them. And part of the motivation for these instructions is to be able to do that. So that's why they're not quite what you would think and why they're two instructions instead of one test and set instruction like we saw for the Intel processor. What the hardware is doing to provide that is giving you an exclusive monitor. So this monitor can go into the states either open or exclusive. When it's in the exclusive state, only the thread that put it into that state can modify that value. When it's in the exclusive state, only one thread, the one that put it in that state, can modify it. When it's in open state, anyone can. And when it's in that exclusive state, it's protecting that memory from other threads. When you do a context switch, it's automatically resetting it to open. Here's how that works in these instructions. So we have these two instructions, load x and store x. So we have that load x instruction that sets the monitor to the exclusive state. 
and reads the current value, stores it in the destination. So it doesn't change the value of the monitored state, but it sets it into the exclusive state. And then we have storex, which is conditional. So storex will only work if that location is in the exclusive state for this thread. This is the functionality we want to provide. We want to have some location that we can use as a lock, and we want to be able to provide mutual exclusion by just doing the call to lock x. When we call lock mutex, if that finishes, when that finishes, we know it's safe to enter the critical section, and then what we need to do when we're done is do unlock. So can we implement lock mutex using these instructions? So if it weren't for this strange thing of two instructions, it seems like we should be able to do it with just the storex. So if we didn't have to, let, let's assume we have a location that's already in the exclusive state. Because that's really the main thing that the load does, is set that location to the exclusive state. Then what will we do with the conditional store? So I'm using slightly different syntax than what the instruction is. Let's assume instead of storing the result in a register and having a look at that, we can use it more like a function call. So we're going to do store x passing in 1, meaning locked, and lock is the location that we're using as our lock. If that returns true, if that returns 1, what does it mean? Yeah, this is like test and set. Right? We've stored one in it, and it was permitted, which means it's in the exclusive state for this thread, so we're all okay. And if not, we keep trying. The only thing that makes this more complicated is we had to do something to set it in the exclusive state, and that's the load. We had to do the load. doesn't really matter where we load into. We're doing the load to set it in the exclusive state. So this is really all we need to do. What we actually want to do is take advantage of the load. So if it is locked, then we don't want to do this attempt. If this attempt fails, it leaves the value unchanged. So it's OK if we do it when it's already locked. But it's going to be better if we get in a state where we're, we're not attempting something that we know will fail. So the way it's done is very much like this. We're doing the load. If the load fails, we keep trying. That's not providing mutual exclusion, right? Because the load might say the lock is open, or the lock value is 0, meaning it's unlocked. But between when we do the load, there's no exclusivity. Another thread could have done a load as well. Once we've done the load, it's in the exclusive state, and now we can do the store. So now we're doing the store, and if the store succeeds, that means it was still in the exclusive state, exclusive to this thread, and now we can, we can enter the critical section. And remember, if there's a context switch between here and here, that's going to reset the exclusive state, and then the store is going to fail. So we would not enter the critical section. We still need the unlock. The unlock is just going to set the value back to 0. Do we need to use the exclusive store, or can we use a regular store in unlock? So is this OK that I'm just using a regular store? There's no, no protection from the monitor when I do a regular store. How do we know that's safe, that we don't need to use an exclusive store when we get to unlock? Or what would it mean if that's not safe? Yeah. OK, so at least we have safety, right? If we, if we never unlock, we still have safety, right? If we're not able to set it back to 0. But if another thread could be doing whatever the lock's protecting at this time, right? If, if the lock is no longer exclusive, then we're already in trouble, because the critical section was running before this. Right? So the whole point of the lock is to know that once we enter the critical section, we have this exclusive property. And this store is safe because no other thread could have the lock at that point. So there's no reason to use the exclusive store here. So this is pretty close to the recommended code. The reason this is not exactly what at least the, the ARM manual recommends to implement a mutex is because this is a loop that keeps executing instructions. So if we care about saving energy, we prefer not to have our processor spinning while it's waiting for something to happen. We would prefer the processor that's waiting for something to happen to save energy. ARM provides instructions to do this. So this is the, the recommended code, which looks very similar to what we had, had. Right? It's doing the load x. It's doing the test. But instead of just jumping back to here, what it's doing is, if it's locked, it's jumping to here, where it's using this wait for update macro. And what wait for update does is put the processor in a mode where it's saving energy, and it's going to be woken up when something that is likely to possibly allow it to continue happens. So there's a couple instructions that ARM provides to do this. There's wait for event and wait for interrupt. These are just hints to the processor. 
these don't provide safe synchronization, they don't provide anything else, they just tell the processor that if you feel like it, it would be a good idea to go into low power mode now. But there's no guarantees about what these instructions do. We could have done all this with one test and set. These instructions are useful if we want to provide lock-free data structures where we can do loads and stores without needing to hold the lock. 